This time in Low Buck Garage, I find a use for old ratchets. I see how good my engine is. Oh, no, this motor's shot. And I take care of my tires. So let me show you what I'm not doing. That buggy right there, if you saw the build on it, I put it in a transmission that doesn't have reverse or fifth gear, just four forward gears. There's a transmission that's fully functional. That is supposed to go in there. This bike needs a new rear brake line. There's a brand new rear brake line. In the shop here, I'm insulating this wall and I've got some insulation up. I've got more insulation right here. I'm not working on that either. I definitely should not be working on this truck because I bought an entire parts truck with it, which I don't have yet, and I don't know what parts are good, so I should not work on this one at all. So in this video, we're working on this one. In my last video on this truck, I called it a mystery truck because I couldn't find a picture of a truck like it. And uh, that's for good reason. It's not a truck. This is actually a combination of several different trucks. So this was never produced by any factory. This is all pieced together. Let me show you what we have. Now, the 125 inch wheelbase uh, definitely looks like it is a bomb service truck. So that chassis um, is pretty well identified. And apparently they never did come with a closed cab. So that's not the right cab for this. Now this cab for sure is not a military cab because there's a hole for a fuel filler neck and the military trucks never had that. I had been guessing that bolt and nut that sticks up there was for a windshield wiper, which it looks like that's true. Also, there's only one of them on the driver's side, which means this cab is from a 40 or 41 civilian truck. Now, because this is a civilian cab, it should have a different gauge cluster. This is a military style gauge cluster, so that shouldn't be in this dashboard. I tracked down the guy who put this name on the door, and um, he never owned this truck, but he did own this door. Apparently he used this as a sign for a shop and hung it out on his fence and then sold these doors at a swap meet over 25 years ago. And I guess they ended up on this truck and were never repainted. So this name has nothing to do with this truck. He just sold them doors. Eh, another piece to the puzzle. Now you guys told me the answer on these drains that point straight down. This was some kind of service truck. So they'd fill these tanks with the gas or the oil and uh, when they needed some to service another vehicle, they put a bucket under, pour it straight down and fill it up. So they had a convenient supply on hand. Now before buying this, I did at least seven minutes of research on the internet. And I found that the motor that was in this supposed vehicle uh, should have been, if it was really a 49, it should have been a Babbitt bearing, splash oiling, low pressure motor. The thing is, the valve cover is bolted down here not through the top. There should be two holes in the top on the original motor. I'm also noticing the head looks like a different color than the block. So this motor might be a complete mutt also. This could be pieced together from different motors. I think I found the actual casting number here. It's right next to the distributor. Looks like we have 3836233. So let's figure out what that is. Now these are the head casting numbers, so we'll figure out if that head actually belongs to this block. Now the block, the casting number comes back to a Series 2, 1955. The head number comes to a Series 1, 1955. Uh, the head was used from 54 to 55. So that's not the head that came on that block. So this truck is definitely a mutt, not a purebred in any way. And that's why I like it, because I don't have to worry about originality, because there isn't any. So I get to have fun with this. Last time you seen this truck in a video, I had just added the dual wheels in the front and then I put dual wheels in the back. I only had one spare tire. That's the one that went in the front. The rear I stole from the other side. Ideally, I want a full set of eight of these mud grips, but um, you can't buy them anymore. Uh, there's not many available new. If they are available, they're expensive and I couldn't find this tread pattern anywhere. A friend of mine wanted a motor that I had, and he has lots of stuff. So I called him up and asked him how he was doing with uh, 750 20 tires. And then these showed up in my yard. I've got seven 750 20 tires, in addition to the ones I already have. I was told that some of these hold air. Uh, this one doesn't have a rim, but it's still got the nubs on it. It's brand new, never been run on the road. 
Looks like it's never been put on a rim. So uh, that's nice. And then some of them are already on bud wheels, the same ones I need. So I am going to go through these, see which ones hold air, and get the truck rolling. That one still has 10 PSI, which means it holds something. This one's got 15. Okay, we're in good shape. This one's got nothing. So we'll put this one to the side for now. Totally flat. Put this in the flat pile. Flat again. Got about five in this one. So three out of these tires already hold air. So I'll air this pile up and I bet they'll hold for a while because they still have air in them. I'll air these ones up and uh, set them to the side and see how long it takes for them to go flat again and then decide what to do. I've run into a problem with these double lug nuts. On quite a few of these wheels, you go to take off the outer nut, it takes off the inner one too. Came up with a trick though. It worked once, let's see if it'll work again. Right now this is just finger tight. So we take our adjustable and put that on the outer nut, which is stuck on the inner one. We take our lug wrench, go to the inner nut, and then we turn this with that hitting the ground. There we go. And then we got it broken free. Now the outer one comes right off, we can tighten the inner one. But we're gonna have to drop it on the ground, tighten all the inner ones off, lift it up again, put the outer ones on, drop it on the ground, tighten the outer ones up. It's a little complicated, but that's what I get for having dual wheels everywhere. It's worth it. I'm gonna take another crack at this door. I've actually soaked it in oil for a little while. This might be some kind of lock. I was told these doors do have a lock on them of some sort. That felt like it moved. All right, so that might be something. Sorry about that. There we go. It might have worked before, I just didn't push it hard enough. It could be this lock had fallen down while it was transported. Not sure. But for now, we got the door open. So we can start looking at some more stuff here. Now I was looking at the shift lever last time, and I found this lever on the side. And I guessed it might be a reverse lockout, but I went over and down, and it went in whether I had the lever pulled or not. But I found out I was doing something wrong. I moved over to the passenger side to go to reverse. It should go to the driver's side. It goes this far without the lever pulled. Pull it. Goes a little further. So that is a reverse lockout, and uh, I just had the shift pattern wrong. But it does appear to work. It locks out reverse gear. All the other four seem to shift. So uh, I think we're in good shape there. Now this lever is definitely supposed to open that hood vent. So uh, let's try to get that popped open. There we go, we've got air conditioning now. Speaking of air conditioning, the military versions of these cabs are supposed to have a support here that'll hold the windshield when it folds out. The civilian versions have this little hole that a crank's supposed to go in. Let's see if we can make that work. We gotta go inside the dashboard here. There's a hole in the dashboard. There's the spline shaft. And underneath it, we have a flat strip of metal that goes through a little toothed wheel and extends down here. So it looks like this wheel just cranks that metal that way and that's how it pops the windshield out. I don't think this one's actually attached the way it's supposed to. Um, there's no bolts holding this in. So, it means we get a better shot of that shaft from down here. Hmm, this thing feels frozen solid. I'm gonna soak this with oil before going any further. We're gonna hang on to that for another day. I got the door latch to retract, and now it's stuck retracted, so I can't close the door. But uh, we'll see if a little bit of a persuasion will do that. There we go, that was easy. Definitely need to do some oiling and working it in. There it goes. It's fixed. But now that I've looked at the motor a little more and know that it's a 55, that means that it has full pressure lubrication. It's a more modern style motor. So that motor is going to be um, better. So I'm a little more encouraged to actually get that thing running. Now it's time for one of my favorite games. What's in my oil pan? Is it oil? Is it water? 
Is it a solid or is it something else? If you want to take a guess, go ahead and leave a comment. All right, time's up. Gotta crack this open and see what we got. The answer is a really long drain plug. Oh, here we go. Oh, I feel water already. Oh, there's water. Lots of water. There's chunks. I see chunks flying by. It's kind of brownish water. Yeah. There's oil. Oh, I got hit with chunks. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to clean off the GoPro after this one. There, there are so many things wrong about that. Uh, well, the answer was, it's still going. There was water, there was oil and solids. So, yeah. I think I'm gonna walk away now. <laughs> Not hopeful on this motor. Kind of convenient. I can take the plugs out with the hood still on. First one has a little bit of rust, not too bad. This one feels a little rustier. Yeah, this one's completely caked in rust. Number three, rusty. Number four, rusty with a different color rust. Number five actually looks like just carbon. Number six is almost completely full of rust. Nice. So we're gonna go straight to exploratory surgery and uh, see what we got inside here. There's definitely a layer of dirt inside this motor. So I'm glad I didn't try to crank it over and get that pump through it. There's dirt filling this thing. I think I got all the bolts off this manifold. There's a couple broken ones, so they came off real easy since they weren't there. Got everything else out. Just a little bit of tapping might do it. Ooh. Uh, let me show you what I see. That is definitely not a good sign. Got wet rust there, dry flaky rust here. This thing is full of junk. Oops. Oh, here's the head. Rusty, really rusty, not too bad. Just a little rusty, not too bad, and terrible. That cylinder number six is gonna be an issue. Here's a close up of the cylinders. Uh, rusty, dirty, flaky, rusty again, carbony, and completely ruined. Well, I'll put a hone in there and see what happens, but that one looks real bad. Cylinder hone's actually hitting something in here. This is a really lumpy cylinder. That may not clean up. Oh, no, this motor's shot. Okay, let me bring you over here. So this is the weird sound I heard with the hone, was going over that, thump, 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 thump. Uh, what happened is the cylinder filled with water, it froze, popped that wall right through. Uh, nothing I can do about that one. So I'm gonna stop here. Uh, there's no point in going any further and look at taking out the motor because that's not staying in there. I'm admiring this throttle linkage. We've got the original throttle rod. It goes from one diameter to another diameter. That is welded to an extension piece, welded to the rest of it, with a piece of uh, bailing wire holding it on and a piece of bailing wire holding a pivot on. So that's pretty much good to go. I'm almost sad I have to remove it to pick this motor out. Now normally, I separate the engine from the bell housing and leave the bell housing on the transmission. But you can't do that with these. There's some bolts you can get to, there's other ones you can't. That one's done from inside the bell housing. Which means we have to separate that bell housing from the transmission in order to get this whole thing out. 
All right, we've got bolts right there. Uh, I only see two bolts, but I'm sure there's some up top too. Looks like the best way to get those top bolts is through this floor here. And it does have an access panel, which doesn't appear to be bolted down. It looks like all the screws are removed. Uh, it might be welded on in a few places, but I think we gotta take this out. So I'm gonna do a little prying. Now whoever worked on this last decided they really wanted this panel to stay because it's welded right there. There's a good amount of weld right there. Probably some on the other side. Which means we actually have to cut the welds before we can remove this access panel that's meant to be removed. When I cut through this I realized it was brazed, not weld. That's the classy way to hack stuff. Now the floor pan has also been brazed on the passenger side. I haven't gotten this door open yet. Um, but I need to cut those braze pieces and I need to get the door open to get access. Um, haven't had any luck with the handle. I got it to turn, but it won't release the door. Then I was looking at the alternate method. We have a wood screw and an old bolt as hinge pins. I'm thinking that might be the easier way to open the door. One bolt. Next one. There we go. There. The easy way to open a door. I'll just save that for later. All right, back to the floor. I got the floor off. I want to show you what we got here. It's kind of interesting. Um, we got a clear view of the transmission and uh, there's no transmission mount of any kind. It just bolts straight to the motor. And then it looks like it has one rod going back, connecting it. Other than that, this whole transmission is kind of just hanging here. These are our pedals here. They bolt directly to the bell housing, not the chassis. So if the engine twists any, these pedals are going with it because they're attached. Uh, so I'm assuming there's not a whole lot of flex in these mounts. Otherwise, it'll be all over the place. Looks like all I have to do is undo those bolts that hold these pedals on, and that whole thing comes free. The clutch is just on a hook, so that just unhooks. Yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll try putting a strap under the transmission so it can support the weight and then take the motor out forward. So I got to go forward anyway to clear this firewall. Got the pedals out of the way. That puddle of water is not from rain. That's what started coming out from the mounting bolt and the transmission. We're going to play a new game now called What's Inside My Transmission? The rules are very similar. Oh yeah, nice clear water. Yeah, I might as well drain that on the ground. That's just water. Oh, that's oil. That goes in the drain pan. All right, so transmission was full of water too. Looks like it was less water than the engine had, so that's something, I think. I wonder if that transmission's gonna work. Yeah, probably, it's only a transmission. Got the bolts out, got a strap under it to take the weight. Yep, she's loose. So pretty much the only thing holding it in now, oh, we got some transfer case linkages, this rod, wherever that goes to, probably transfer case, drive shaft, but uh, the transmission should stay here. So I'm going to try to move the engine forward to get off the uh, splines on the clutch plate. If that works, we might be pretty well home free. Yeah, I just realized I should take this bar off because I have a feeling when I go up, this is going to get in the way. In order to get to the nut that holds that rod on, got to yank the heater out. Huh. The tubes for the heater go through the firewall, so I can't drop it down. And the dashboard's here, so I can't come straight up. Huh. Interesting. How do we get around this problem without using a sawzall? Alright, you yank this this way, twist the transmission that way, twist this this way, and it fit out. There we go. Alrighty. Actually, Tropic Air. This is a pretty serious heater. Twin fan, big hoses. 
This was meant for some cold weather. Uh, I don't need it, but it could come in handy somewhere else. Got a little bit of an issue. Can't get the clutch linkage past the steering column. That's sitting there. I can't move this because the starter's hitting this battery box. I've got the motor stuck partially up and I can't let it down. I'm not sure how this went this wrong. Got a little bit frantic there towards the end and camera battery died and I don't even know what you saw at this point. So let me tell you what happened. The motor mount was underneath that steering column and I couldn't move this way because of this battery box. I should say, because of this battery box, I took the sawzall to this one and uh, knocked off the corner and that got the freedom of movement. This beam and this beam, I got those two caught on this pulley and that pulley. So I basically couldn't let it down because this one was on top of the beam. I couldn't go up because that was under the beam, so it was trapped between the two. This generator brace was already welded up anyway. I just sawzalled right through it so I could relieve the pressure and get the motor to move out of the way. Those things happen. At least it didn't cause any damage to anything that wasn't already damaged. It got a little bit ugly, but it's out. And at least it got ugly with the bad motor. So when I get a good motor, I can put it in a little bit better. Here's a better view of the reason I pulled this motor. That's another piece of the cylinder wall that's not attached to this one anymore. Um, I don't even think you can sleeve that one to save it, which is unfortunate. This truck has a nifty feature. It checks its own fluid levels on the axle. I can see it's dripping out here, and that's fresh gear oil on the tire. So I know that axle has oil in it. Done. Now, this truck's going to be primarily used off-road, so I really wanted more aggressive off-road tires, like those mud grips in the back. But those are the only ones I have, and I can't find any more. So, uh, what I've got to deal with is street tread tires. Now, I have heard of tire grooving, and I have seen this done in a video. I'm going to try it myself, see if we can turn these into an off-road tire. Now, you know I'm always concerned about things looking very professional. So uh, I'm going to try to make this tread pattern fairly even. So I'm going to measure the circumference of the tire. Let's just go every two inches and call it done. There'll just be one that's close together. We'll ignore that one. I could do the math, but that sounds tedious and boring. Oh, I already did it wrong. There we go. Let's try that one. I made marks are all the way around the tire, but as I was doing it, I realized that's an awful lot of them. So I'm going to go every other mark for now and we'll see what happens. Now 45 degrees is clearly a good tread angle because that's what my combination square has on it and it seems really easy. Now I need to actually make the grooves in these tires. Tire grooving tools come in both gas and electric varieties. Uh, I happen to have an electric battery powered one here. So let's do some grooving.
that goes pretty quick and easy. Now, I already have tread on here. You can see the bottom of the grooves. I figure as long as I don't go past that, it should be fine. So let's keep going. That's working halfway decent. Now, measuring and marking these tires got really boring really fast. So I stopped. And uh, the excuse I'm going to use is that modern tread have asymmetric patterns to break up the harmonics so they don't make a lot of noise while they drive. This is automatically asymmetric because I'm just sort of randomly putting lines in it. Perfect. Huh. There goes my battery. One line to go. Oh well, I think I got a spare somewhere. You can see the tread is, it's about half a finger deep. It's at least something. And I didn't go any deeper than the tread that was already there. Uh, pretty much skimmed it. I think the tire is as structural as it was, which was not very. But uh, I think I have more traction. It's got to be better. Now the other tires I worked on were really bad and leaked air and I didn't really care about them. These are some of the good tires I got. So, uh, I really don't want to cut a hole through them. And the other ones cut really easy. So what I did was I added a depth stop to my grooving tool. That way I'll hit these blocks of wood before I get too deep. Hopefully. That's the theory. And if enough of you like and subscribe, hopefully the YouTube algorithms will keep me from destroying a good tire. <sighs> Oh yeah, that worked perfect. I got a zillion more of these to go. All set. Went quick and easy, didn't even pop a tire. Uh, the guides are definitely the way to go. And thank you very much for your support. Now I got all train tires. Not quite mud grips, but definitely better than the highway tread they had before. One thing I still can't figure out is what this little circle plate is for. Now you guys have given me a lot of ideas. One thing confusing the issue is whether or not this is supposed to be horizontal or vertical before the bumper got bent. So I'm going to straighten out the bumper and then we'll find out. This bumper hit pretty hard and was folded back and uh, the support of these C channels is just all uh, folded up. So I'm going to go ahead and slice through those, make it easier to straighten the front, then I'll straighten these and then weld it back together. I think I'm all the way to the front edge. Now let's get the bottom side. Well then, that went a little awry. Try a little more power. Okay, I'm gonna stand back a bit. I have to go up. Right idea, wrong angle. Make sure you guys stand back from this. exact angle I needed. Now this is the way the bumper is supposed to look. So this plate was horizontal. Now plausible things I've heard are beer keg holder, water cooler holder, grease barrel holder, um, traffic cone holder. Basically it's got to hold something that you just set in there. Maybe. Or maybe it has some other use. I still have absolutely no idea. But um, at least we know it's horizontal. So that solves one thing. I needed some daylight to show you this a little better. But now we have a straight bumper 
and we have a horizontal circle for something. That's definitely the way this was built. That was meant to be horizontal. That's very sturdy and that was not then. Now that I got this door working, I need some kind of handle. This is the broken half track one. It works from the inside, it has the right size square drive. It's too short to get in to hit this latch. So I need a longer square drive. It's 516 square, which is good for key stock. Went to the local hardware store and for a couple bucks got some 516 key stock. So now I have plenty of material that can go in there and turn the latch. But now I have to turn this. In this drawer, I have my square drive sockets. For some reason, I have at least six 516 square drive sockets. I'm going to pick the two rustiest because I don't really need all of these. So now I have something that can drive this 516 stock. Digging my ratchet drawer, I've got six quarter inch drive units. This one works great. This one works great. This one works great. This one can't help but work great. These two are the variable drive type. You will sometimes ratchet in both directions, sometimes randomly, sometimes they work, and they almost always skin your knuckles in use. And ever since the local Sears store closed down, I haven't gotten a free replacement. So, uh, these kind of look like door handles. Well, that'll work. But it's kind of floppy. Uh, I gotta do something about that. Found some plastic bushings that fit right there. Perfect. The inside doesn't fit on this but it's easy to make holes bigger. Now this fits nice and tight with very little wiggle, but there's no depth control. Piece of tubing. You mark that right about there and slice it. I'm sure lawyers would say, don't cut off your finger while doing this. Eh, you can do it if you want, but I prefer not to. We're gonna slide this tubing over this square bar which I should have heated it up first, but we'll make it go. Yeah, she'll go through. There it goes. There, fully seated. All right, so we'll slide this in all the way. There, that's as far as the tubing let it go. Somewhere around there. This is on there actually pretty reasonably, but I want to make sure it doesn't rattle off. All right, let's look through our bins of stuff. And we have our roll pin drawer. And that's too long. That looks about right. Let's put a roll pin through it. Oh, it's even a spiral one. Nice. Let's we'll go right through everything. There we go. Now it's a matter of making sure this doesn't fall out. Now, I like to tap holes in exactly the same setup I drilled them in. That way I know it goes straight in the same hole. So even if the hole's not straight, the tap goes in with the hole. And you just turn it by hand. If you feel daring, you can do this under power, but you usually break a tap if you do that. Got a several little screw. I'll find a washer that fits in there and that'll lock the end in place. Got the screw in there, so that's held in place. There's a tiny little bit of play in there, not much at all. So uh, this thing shouldn't rattle, but it is enough to make it move freely. These are one of those push-on type ratchets. So they lock onto the socket and we got a door handle. There's another benefit. If you're leaving this truck somewhere, press the button take off the door handle and take it with you. It's an anti-theft feature. Now I got a latch working, it's time to get the door working right. I see a big gap on the bottom there, really small gap here, and uh, it's kind of overlapping here. So I think the whole door needs to twist this way. Um, at least try that initially, and then see what we gotta do. So we gotta move this hinge forward. So these are the screws that hold the hinge in. I'm gonna try to pop these loose and add a shim under this side. Good old impact screwdriver is probably the thing to use here. I couldn't break that free, so we're gonna go with an easier method. We'll just adjust the entire door frame. Let's see how that fits now. That closed up that gap nicely. 
Got this one just even. There. Big adjustable wrench did it. Doesn't bother trying to take those screws out. This is easier. Have a little bit of sag in the hinges, but they are screws again, so probably replace those at some point. But good enough for now. Now I'm glad I got a tight fit in that door handle because little rattles from things like that can really hamper the driving experience. That won't be an issue. Now we need to talk about the elephant in the room, or more to the point, the engine that's not under this hood. I considered a few different options, considering repowering it, but the more I learned about these old stove bolt sixes, the more I kind of wanted to have one. And I think I want to repower it with the same motor it had. Now they made a lot of those. They powered pretty much everything in the 40s and 50s that Chevy made. But the town I'm in wasn't really a big town in the 40s and 50s and didn't have a whole lot of vehicles. So there's not too many of them around here. I did manage to find one though. The seller assured me that it does not run currently. He has never seen it run and I need four wheel drive to come pick it up. Obviously that's gonna work out well. So I'm ending this video for now. We'll pick up again when I have another engine. And uh, that should be a fun adventure to go get. Hope you guys are having fun too, and we'll see you next time. FedEx just arrived. Shiny. That is a pretty seriously thick core. Only 168 bucks, including shipping. Looks close to the right size. I'm sure I can make it fit.